have ever thought that SaaS and cycling could become a business? Our next guest, Robbie Ventura, took his passion and talent in the cycling world and created a multi-million dollar business called Velocity. I can't wait for you to hear about it. I'm excited to see you outside, out of your Lycra and off the bike. We, uh, we Do I got, look the same without a helmet on? Well, you know, almost the same. Your hair is a little better. <laughs> um, but no, thanks for being here. The Lady Boss Podcast is really designed to help other entrepreneurs figure out the shortcuts so they don't make all the mistakes that yeah. at least I've made um, and um, most of the people I know have. So um, we'll dive right into it. Perfect. I want to hear, um, first, just... Not that many people we interview are professional athletes. So can you give me just 30 seconds on how that happened and how you got on the tour? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I was always an athlete as a kid. I had a lot of energy. I actually had um, diagnosed with like underdeveloped lungs. So my parents were really into getting me like doing exercising, right? So they started me with soccer. And the craziest thing happened is I love baseball and I love soccer. And my buddy on my soccer team's like, hey, I want to go to the velodrome in Kenosha. This is going to take longer than 30 seconds. You got, we good? Okay. You're, you're just keep going. Um, so basically, we're going to go down to the velodrome in Kenosha. And I went down there with a, with a BMX bike. This is a track. A velodrome is a concrete track. And we're so, so lucky to have two of them here. We have one in Kenosha and we have one in Northbrook. There's only like 30 in the United States. And we have two of them within like 20, 30 miles a year. And I went down there, got on my BMX bike, put the helmet on, and we did a race. We did one lap. And my friend Shane and I destroyed the other people in the, in the group, right? And there was like, these kids race all the time. And I'll never forget this. I was so excited. I had my blue ribbon and Shane's dad drove him back to my house, me and Shane back to my house. And he said, Rob, Bob, my dad's name's Robert as well. These kids really did good on the track. I think you should come on down to the velodrome and like see what these kids are doing. I mean, it's pretty cool. Like Shane and Robbie got first and they won by like, you know, half the track. And my dad's like, okay, fine, I'll go next week. So we go next week and they start everybody else on the front line and they start Shane and I back like 50 meters on the velodrome. So we had to make up 50 meters before we can pass everybody and try to win. And I just remember my dad was there and Shane's dad was there and, they, and my, the, the dads hold you by the back of the seat. And think about this, we're like, there, there's like, there's like 10 people in front of us and then Shane and my dad, is, my dad's there, they're holding us, they let us go. We just launch. We catch him like before the final turn. Shane and I both go around the outside. We get first and second again. And I was like so excited about my cycling skills, right? Like I could do this well. I literally go down to pick up my ribbon with my dad and everyone's like, Bob, what are you doing back down here? Like everybody knew my dad in this entire infield. And because after the stock bike races, the real racers go, the track racers, yeah. the guy who have experience that have pinned numbers on their back, they're good. And every one of them, like these old timers knew my dad. And I kind of didn't make a big deal about it. And I go, I get home, I go, Dad, dude, everybody knew who you were down there. That was crazy. He's like, well, I didn't want to tell you this, but I used to race. And he pulls out this box. He's like state champion, national champion. He was like the greatest bike racer ever. Never even said anything to me. And he's like, I just didn't want to push you into the sport that I love so much. I'm like, are you kidding me? You were this good at the sport and never even told me about it. So he started coaching me and he was just the greatest coach ever. I mean, like he knew everything about the sport. He got me the best bikes. He got everything dialed in. I went to the nationals. I started placing and it just kind of evolved. I just got better and better and better at it, but I was a little bit big. So wait, for the velodrome to the tour, how many, how many years is that? It's a long time. I literally started, I raced, I was starting racing when I was eight years old and um, I started, I, I signed with the U.S. Postal Service when I was 29. So wow. it took a long time, but, but, I didn't always want to be a bike racer. I wanted to be a hockey player. And so I kind of got out of cycling a little bit and really focused my energies on, on hockey. Like I wanted to play professional hockey. That's all I cared about. And I was good, but I wasn't, I was, you don't know how good you are at something until you get to the highest level. Yeah. Cause the difference, you feel like you are really, really good at things until you get to people that are just a little bit better in the, in the, in the, and the, and the gains yeah. and the differences are so tight and, and, the, and they're so narrow at the top that I ended up having a rough junior A career. I ended up playing college at uh, hockey at Lake Forest College. 
and then I started cycling a lot more in college. And I went to the World Championships in 1993. I made the World Championship cycling team as I was going to college, as I was playing hockey in 1993. Went to Norway, I went to Norway and I got fifth in the elimination, which was a big race on the track. As soon as I got back, the kind of word started to spread and I signed a pro contract with Saturn, which was a big um, professional team in the United States. And I had a great career there, won a lot of bike races, and then I signed with U.S. Postal Service. Now, I would just want to uh, correct you. I never did the Tour de France because my teammate, was everybody knows him, was Lance Armstrong, and he was the greatest tour racer that's ever raced the bicycle. And I was a sprinter, and they never brought a sprinter to the Tour de France because the entire team was built around getting him the victory. Right. In the Tour de France, they usually bring a sprinter. They bring different types of riders to win different stages, but our team was so focused on Lance that there was no room for a sprinter. And to be honest, I just wasn't that good at those really long races. I was better at shorter races. So that wasn't a race I would even do well in. So I won a lot of bike races as a professional and I commentated the Tour de France for from 2006 to 2013. So I spent a lot of time in France, a lot of time, more time than I want, um, but uh, unfortunately never raced the race. Okay, so normally speaking, people don't uh, associate the you know, not all the time do professional athletes get good at business. And now you find yourself with two businesses and um, both very different, but um, you sort of took, uh, first of all, give us some numbers around like how many people in the United States are what you call road bikers, which is what your business is evolved around, right? Cycling. Yes, yeah, cycling. Absolutely. Um, there are, a, there are, there are I, I mean, the numbers are all over the board, right? But there is an enormous amount of people riding bicycles on the road, and it's growing and growing every single year. So our total addressable market is enormous for what I try to do. But, but back to how do I get from cycling to, professional, to, a, to a business owner? I, I graduated from college. I'm one of the few cyclists. I've never met a cyclist when I graduated, from, when I finished my pro career, that ever went to college. Now a lot more do, because hmm. collegiate teams have cycling teams now, or colleges have cycling teams, so a lot more um, um, scholarships are going to cyclists. But to me, I was missing something as a pro cyclist. I was, it's a very selfish exi ex existence. It's very difficult, you do everything for yourself. Your whole life is kind of circled around you and getting better than the next guy and beating the person next to you and fighting for a contract. It's super, super cutthroat, and, and you, have, you develop a selfishness that isn't always great. Right. Not great for relationships, not great for kids, not great for a lot of things. So literally, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like going into the financial markets. I passed my Series 6. I was trying to figure out what am I going to do when I retire from professional cycling because I see so many of these cyclists, you don't make money like pro football. Like the best paid cyclists make like 500 thousand to like a million bucks a year. There's some that make a lot more than that, but that's the kind of the pro number. And that's not enough to retire and finish your life on. So I was like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do after cycling? I started like thinking I was gonna be a financial planner. And then I was on a bike ride and I helped, this guy's like, man, I've been in the back of the pack my whole life. I just wanna get stronger. Give me some tips. What do you guys learn in the pro peloton? And as a cyclist myself, I had to do everything right or I couldn't compete at that level. Mm -hmm. I had to be perfect. Like I didn't have the massive VO2 max. I didn't have the massive horsepower. If I didn't train perfectly, eat perfectly, sleep perfectly, do everything right, I would, I would get dropped. So I learned everything about making myself good. So I literally met with this guy. I remember, I'll never forget it. It was EJ Lenzi. He owns EJ's place in Skokie, a restaurant. He was, a, he was an owner of, uh, he was one of the people that started up Gene and Giorgetti's in the city. And he said, Robbie, help me out. And on the back of a cocktail napkin, I wrote him out a training plan. I said, try these intervals, get a power meter, do these things, and try to do it on a regular basis. He goes, okay. He's like, what if I paid you to come ride with me sometimes? I'm like, no, 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 just do the training plan. Literally three months later, he was the fastest guy in his group. And the word spread. He's like, oh my gosh, what you told me, I did it, it was perfect. I got this power meter, did exactly what you said. And people started calling me saying, hey, I saw what you did for EJ. Can you do that for me? And I was like, Lori, why don't I just start coaching people, like writing training plans and see what happens while I'm racing. I was a racer, I was, I was like still in the middle of my pro career. And I started doing it on the side and it started to grow and grow and grow. And I literally decided to stop cycling because I was making more money coaching.
than I was racing my bicycle. So it was a perfect flip for me. I got lucky. It's funny. So we hear all the time that the best success stories are where your customer takes you to the promised land. And that's a great example. Like you were doing something else and you run into this opportunity and the opportunity is really the opportunity. That is such a good reminder because uh, it's always about the customer. How, okay, so you're coaching. What made you start Vision Quest? So this thing just started to blow up, right? People started coming to me. These, these stories of these guys getting all the success started going, it didn't hurt that I was a member of the Postal Service and people yeah. wanted to be associated with me as well. I literally, in the back of one of our rooms in our house, and we had a small, small house. We, we had a really tiny little townhouse. I got all this blood lactate equipment. No one even knew what blood lactate was. No one knew what VO2 maxes were. And I had all this information from all the coaches that I've had throughout my pro career. And I started applying it to these beginner athletes, these, these literally weekend warriors. And my business grew so much that I was like, I'm going to rent some space. I'm going to start to like hire more coaches. I'm going to start to like make this a real business. And like I said, as soon as I finished cycling, I had a full blown business going on and it was phenomenal. And what I really figured out and no one else figured this out is that I could coach with these machines, a lot of people indoors based off of percentage of how strong they were. So most of the time when you ride next to somebody, you're telling someone to go this hard, you're telling other people to go that hard. I had a machine or I had a system where the machine would automatically regulate based on how strong somebody was. So everybody in the class could get the same relative workout. I know it's common now, but I was one of the first people to have that. So the word spread on that as well. He can coach a bunch of people perfectly with this percentage of threshold thing that he rigged up. So that started to grow and then we moved out of one building, moved out of the second building and then we went to the city of Chicago and I hired Dave Noda. That was a huge turning point because the, the suburbs are only so big, the city of Chicago was massive and it really opened up our business huge when, I, when, when we opened up our second studio in the city. So you really, you find more people in a city environment that are those kind of road cyclists for the weekend than you would in, in the very wealthy suburbs of Chicago? That wanted to train indoors because the city's a mess. Okay. You can't ride in the city. Okay. So the city was a perfect spot for indoor training because yep. the outdoor training was too dangerous. Yep. So it ballooned. Okay. And that was how many years ago? Oh God, you're going to make me Approximately think. 20. Uh, this was probably 2007, six. Okay, so you told me multiple times that during the pandemic, like all of us, um, I know I was worried about losing our business. You could have lost it because nobody could come to your studio, which was the format you were making money at yep, that time. 100%. And you had those trips, which also were shut down. So what went through your head and then how did Velocity come into your head? Yeah, that, that, I mean, I'm sure every person you've talked to in these podcasts tell you how rough you know, the pandemic was. For us, and, and, I, and I, I think it was actually, the, we had the worst potential business for the pandemic. And I lived in the worst potential place in Highland Park that was so strict against anything in terms of group working out. They, didn't, they banned us from, in, they had a, I went, to, I'll never forget this. I went into Highland Park and there was a thing on my door saying, this business is closed, do not come in here. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. My business is done. And all of a sudden the word started to spread that you can't ride outside. The pandemic is so bad that if you're riding in a group with people, you're expelling all this air and it's going on the, they did this weird study in Holland. I definitely don't know how they got their data, but it said that it was worse to ride in a group outside than inside. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do outdoor rides either now. What am I gonna do? And I spent literally an hour only. And I said, Noda, send out an email to everybody. I'm gonna do a video and I'm gonna talk about the pandemic and I'm gonna ask people to help me and support me. And I'm gonna give them full coaching from me, virtually using Zoom, and, and I'm gonna send everybody the workout, and I'm gonna coach them on Zoom. This is before anybody did anything, like this is instantaneously as soon as it happened. And the first ride I had like six people, and a bunch of people quit. Next ride I had like 15 people, another bunch of people quit. Mm. All of a sudden, people stopped quitting and started going to my Zoom classes, and I had 100 people on my Zoom class. Like, it, we've never done an indoor ride with even close to that many people. But the word started to spread. I started to do more and more classes. I got more and more instructors to do Zoom classes. And someone said, why aren't you like, why don't you do this for your business? Like, why don't you take your ability to leverage your coaching and your ideas and push it out to the world? Because 
it's awesome. Your classes are great. I never get Robbie Ventura to teach me something. I'm in Chicago. I get these other instructors to teach my indoor class. Now I'm learning from you. This is great. I'll pay for this. I heck, I'll invest in this. Like, let me like help you do this business. And I had a few people that were like, I'm totally into it. So I sat down with a buddy of mine, Clay Brock, and a couple others, and we came up with a business plan on how we can build this virtual cycling program that could rival Peloton, mm. and, but for more serious cyclists. It's evolved since then, so it's a really cool story. But basically, that was the, that was the genesis, and we, we raised $3.4 million, million. We only wanted to raise two. It was so, it, people were so frothy to like raise money at this point. It, this was like a, few, a couple years ago that we raised more money than we initially wanted. Wow. And that's how Velocity started. So you're in a business now where you're, you know, you have a board, you have investors that you report to. How's that compared to, you know, being a rogue entrepreneur? And I say that in the best of ways. Yes. I've also always been a rogue entrepreneur, never had investors. That's great. I think that's a good thing. Um, being a rogue entrepreneur is, is terrific, but I, I want to take it to the next level. I want to help more people, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is through this platform. And I had to take on investment, right? And it's, a, it's much different. It's much, much different. I think it's actually better for me. It gives me guardrails. I get a little loose with my ideas sometimes, no. and I just I, this kind of keeps me more on track. And I think my board is, if I have one area that I've learned more than anything else it's I have the greatest board ever I have the CEO of one of the greatest cycling companies in the world I have um, two of my lead investors and people that I completely respect and they've taught me more in the last two years I've learned more about business about success about everything in life from this board I really leverage them some people's boards they're nervous by them right and I was in the beginning too I wanted to impress them on my first board meeting I was scared and nervous but what I've learned and what, what has really helped our business is our board involvement. Hmm. They have literally changed our business in such a positive way. And they're not easy, they're not pushovers. They give me it straight, they make sure our financials are on, 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 on par, they communicate to the investors, they do some of that heavy lifting. I gave all of my investors full transparency to our board. They can call them and reach out to them anytime they want. So they know everything that we're doing is, is positive and is straightforward and is and as right as it should be. Uh, so I know you raised uh, north of $3 million a couple of years ago, and then I think you raised more money recently. Yep. Uh, so what, is, what does that look like? So what do you do with the money, and then when do the, the board start seeing profitability, or when does the company start seeing profitability in a software business? Yeah, software businesses are tricky. They, they always cost more money than you think. This is what everybody told me initially. They were like, Raise this much money, but trust me, you're going to burn through it because software is very, very expensive. It takes forever to have it done. Um, and they were correct. I would made some mistakes early on. We took $3.4 million exactly in the, in the first round, and a large portion of that money went towards developing software and our initial marketing budget, customer acquisition, and we didn't do that well. And the reason why we didn't do that well in our first run is because we went directly to consumer. We went from, we designed a product, that we thought customers would come and, and take my class all over the world. And what we learned over the time is we had other guest coaches that would come onto, this, onto the platform and all of their athletes would go to their class. But once the guest instructor went away, the guest coach, their athletes went away as well. So we evolved as a company and learned that the customer, the, the end customer wasn't, it wasn't a B2C business, it was a B2B, B2B. business. And not only was it B2B from, to give the coaches the opportunity to do this for their athletes, because Vision Quest did great. Vision Quest as a client of Velocity did great because all of our customers were loving the product. But if you weren't with Vision Quest and you already had a coach or you had a training plan, it was hard to get them to come take my classes. So we, we pivoted and we went B2B from, 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 so we made this a platform that all coaches can use. But we also designed these CAN plans. So Trek Travel and all these training groups and all these Grand Fondos now can have a packaged 12-week plan to get people ready for a cycling trip or ready for a Grand Fondo, which is a 100-mile ride, or ready for a charity ride. And people will pay for those CAN plans as well. And the charity makes a little bit of money and Velocity makes money. So that was our big pivot. But we were running out of money. So we had to raise another million and a half in this last round. 
and our plan to profitability, our plan to just break even is 27 months. Like we have a 27 mm. month process of, because we look at the total addressable from market. From now or from when the business started? The business started over two years yeah. ago. Our, money, our business will start making money 27 months from now, but it will be worth a ton of money if it starts making money. Because once it starts making money, your month, it's a SaaS business. Right. It's a month over month. Those businesses trade for 10 to 20 times revenue. I mean, it's a massive multiple yeah. because we have all this, every month we get $20 from all these different cyclists that have all these different coaches. So it's a great business. And that's what we tell our, that it, we, we send out a letter every month saying this is our revenues, this is our projection, did we meet or did we go below projection? And if we hit these projections, we're gonna be worth this much money in this much time. And that's what our investors want. They don't want monthly revenue or they don't want monthly like payments. They want to be able to sell this for 20 times what they put in or more. And that's really what we're focused on. And we have a whole process of how that happens and we keep our investors up to speed. Are we hitting these projections? Are we missing them? Is there a reason why we're missing them? So our investors are happy as long as we're meeting these projections that we hit because we know the multiple that we can get if we get to this certain number. And it's a pretty short runway for them. Even if they are investor on day one, we're looking at maybe an investment over six or eight years. Max. Like the, the initial, like we want to be done in four years. And again, it's all kind of this projection math, but at the end of the day, you got to start taking slices of that as we go through this process. And the one thing that I've always been super like open about is our financials. We want our investors to be on every single month. Our investors get a report with exactly what's going on. So. It's not a surprise. Nothing is a surprise to our investors. Oh my gosh, I spent a year and I haven't seen any money. Well, this is the process. This is how it's going to go. Yeah. And they all signed on to that when they when they initially invested with us. Um, and and that's yeah. Well, how the process I mean, works. maybe why you have such a good relationship with the board is because you are so transparent as a person exactly. in general. And I think you are a very open book. And I think um, I've always found that goes. A long way. First of all, the people that work for you are like, great, he's real. Because I think everybody would look at you and put you on a pedestal, obviously. You've had this crazy great yeah. um, success. And when they find out you're real and, you know, sometimes things are working, sometimes they aren't. I mean, that's what successful business people are all about. Yep. And they don't want to make 10%. They yeah. don't want to. People that invested in this business don't want to see us making a little bit of money. They want to see us make, making something incredible and having people start to use it and it hockey sticking yeah. and then it being sold. And the nice thing about it is, is we have already, I mean, my mindset is around selling this business. Every decision we make is about selling this business eventually. We already are lining up people that could potentially buy the business. And what would, what would this business be for, for a company like Trek? Why would this be, why would this be something Trek would want to buy? And when you start to make business decisions and thoughts, you have to think that way for the investor and for myself for that matter, because I want to sell this business and make a lot of money as well. So I think we're doing it the right way. And again, this is all supported and helped by the board. I mean, what I've learned over the last three years has just been mind blowing. And, and, and if I can give people one bit of advice is surround yourself with people that know a lot more than you, inspire you and believe in you because that's my board and that's that's why I'm so confident. Oh, such good lessons. I've always, always thought I, I built my first business to sell it 10 years later and that happened and I knew who I would sell it to and I built the whole thing around it Incredible. and that is great advice. And the other thing, it's, it dawns on me yeah. that you're going to get your hockey career after all that. Oh, you're going to get your hockey, hockey stick, stick and, and that's going to be your hockey stick to the big check. my favorite part of the Lady Boss podcast because we put our guests on the spot to answer five questions about how they really got to be who they are along their entrepreneurial journey. So Robbie, you ready? Let's go. All right. Give us your favorite employee retention tool. My favorite employee retention tool, um, I think it's culture. Like if you create a culture where they're motivated, they're excited, and they're learning, that's the key. Like for me, Money, forget it. You'll lose them to money for sure. There's always somebody who will pay more. It's really about if you keep them learning and you keep them, and you have a culture of learning and support, I think that's it. Robbie, what's your favorite business book? 
That's an easy one. Um, I give every, all of my employees, all of my kids, everybody that I know, I, I'm going to tell everybody here to get the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. It's really about the importance of a growth mindset in a business. Awesome. Great advice. Um, would you share with us your favorite, the favorite advice that your best mentor gave you? Surround yourself with people that believe in you more than you believe in yourself. I think that is, everybody has to find, that's for your mate you want that, for your business partners you want that, you want people that really believe in what you can do um, and, and you'll achieve it. You'll rise, you'll meet their standard. Oh, that's awesome, love it. What's the Robbie Ventura superpower? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the ability to take whatever comes my way and try to find a positive spin on it. It's, it's, like, it's like maybe yes, maybe no. I think when things go sideways or bad, I see them as opportunities rather than um, challenges. I mean, they're challenges, but I just sometimes think things happen for a reason. And if you think deep enough and wait it out long enough, it's probably a good thing in the end. It's a great mindset. And if you were to give our listeners uh, one piece of advice that would help catapult their businesses forward, what would it be? You got to grind. You <laughs> have to. I mean, nothing is easy. I don't care what anybody tells you. Do this and you'll make a bunch of money. People that are successful know how to grind. They have grit. All five. Five on yep. five. I'm a believer. I don't know. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.